We're glad we'd like to welcome each and every one of you today. It's such a gorgeous day outside. I know there will be people coming in as we get to singing, and, and we'll sing them in. We're glad you are here, those of you joining us online. We uh, pray that this will be a service that will bring you closer to our Lord and our Master. As you are able here today, would you stand and sing together? We're going to have a great time singing. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he, you know what, now let's sing it together, here we go. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Thanks so much. We're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves to somebody that you have or have not seen this week. Go ahead and greet one another. As you work where you're back, we're going to go ahead and continue with our singing. Go ahead and remain standing as you are able. My wife says I'm talking a little too fast, so I'll slow down. I'm uh, ready to go. Here we go. Next song. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine god is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good god is good all the time here we go, all together. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. If you're walking through the valley, there are shadows all around. Do not fear, He will guide you, He will keep you safe and sound. He has promised to never leave you, nor forsake you, and His word is true, God is good. All the time. 
so much for your singing. Would you go with the Lord, go to the Lord in prayer with me today. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. We know that you are good. We are thankful for that. And we know we live in a fallen earth, but if we look to you, that you will be there. And that you will, uh, as we ask to have you walk with us, that you would do that. And that I would ask that you'd be here today and your spirit be among us and that we'd know that. We pray for those that are on the road, those traveling. We know there's many uh, that not feeling well, sick, that you would just comfort and be with them. We pray for the um, wars, the problems over in the Ukraine, that it would just get solved and be done. We know you can intervene. We just pray for that. As we continue on here, I just ask that you would be with each person in their hearts and that as we sing these songs of praise, that it'll be for your glory and for you. And that uh, whether we're given one talent or ten, that we just are asked to use them for you. And as I just pray that we would do that throughout now and throughout this week, and that we would continue to always look to you as our Lord and Master, our Savior, the one that forgives our sins. It's in your Son's name I pray. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you the grid. You free every captain and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things.
above it all. Hallelujah, God unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You see every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the light. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Oh, God, you have done great things. Amen. We're going to go ahead and move into our prayer time. We're going to dim the lights. For those of you joining us online, you can have prayer requests. You can always send them in. There's also at the people here in the congregation, there will be in the bulletin little white pieces of paper if you'd rather write a prayer request or praise or whatever on the sheet and put it in the offering. You are welcome to do so. There will be people around the room. We welcome you to pray with us. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, here we go. How marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me he took my sin and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to calvary and suffered and died alone how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me we're going to sing one more verse of that great song here we go last time when with the ransomed in glory his face i at last shall see will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Thank you again so much for your singing. Would you please be seated? We have a treat today. Jody will be bringing the message. Come on up, Jody. Good morning. Rick is on vacation the next couple of Sundays, so uh, this week and next week you'll be hearing from myself and from Jeremiah. <clears throat> so, being that Rick is at the end of his, uh, his series on Hebrews, we pretty much had a wide open door as to where, where to go. And so, uh, where I'm going to be going today is something that uh, just traveling down a road, a thought road that for me was inspired um, right here a little better than a month ago um, on a Sunday. 
And it was something that was said not during the message. In fact, I probably couldn't even say exactly what the message was that day. It was certainly during this, the sermon series on Hebrews. But it was actually after the service when Patrick came up to do announcements, and he was going to be talking about these upcoming fundraisers, the flamingo flocking and the, the dessert auction. But it was during that time that he also gave a really nice explanation of why this youth trip coming up was so important and the things that, that take place there year after year, this trip to, to CIY. But he compared it to a couple of stories in the Old Testament um, of course, we all know about the book of Daniel and Daniel and, and his three friends that were, that were hauled off from Israel and, and taken into captivity in Babylon. But he made a connection that morning that I, had never, that I had never noticed before. But he talked about how these bright young men, Daniel and his three friends, they were recognized as being that bright, and so they were brought into this training program where they would have been completely immersed in Babylonian culture, all their philosophies, their science, their religions. And despite that, throughout the course of their entire lives, being immersed in that culture, they never lost sight of their faith and their God. And Patrick that day pointed to a connection to King Josiah, who was one of the last kings in Israel before before they were conquered by the Babylonians. He became king when he was 10 years old. His father and his grandfather, and I think even his great-grandfather, he had a whole string of predecessors that were horrible, and they had pretty much turned their backs on God and walked away. And fortunately, King Josiah, because he was so young, had some good advisors, and they were sent to clear out the temple, the, the temple of the Lord that had been filled with idols, and when, it, when they did this, they discovered the books of the law that, that they had been lost for generations. Imagine if the Bible just disappeared for two or three generations, and all of a sudden, he's having someone read him these words, and he's so convicted that he just um, made great efforts to just reinstate this, these words of God in the society. And the connection that Patrick made was this was likely a reason that Daniel and his three friends were so strong in their faith, even being immersed in the Babylonian culture. And that just kind of blew my mind because I hadn't made that connection before. But one of the things that was pointed out in that short little announcement was this dichotomy between the Israelites living in Jerusalem and the Israelites living in Babylonian, Babylonian captivity and how in our modern world today, we tend to place ourselves in one of those two areas. And I, what, what he said that, that morning, and I agree, that there's a tendency to think of ourselves more as the Israelites in Jerusalem. And by that, let me explain. So here we are in our, in our United States, land of the free, the home of the brave. We're very proud of our country. We're proud of our heritage. We're a Christian nation. We're, we've led the world for a long time in that, and most of the founding fathers were believers in Christ, and all of those things are absolutely true in my, as far as I'm concerned. And so we see ourselves as those Israelites in Jerusalem, as this place blessed by God, and all of those things are true. However, if you, if you were to take a snapshot of the founding of our country and how things were in that day and then take a snapshot of how things are today, clearly something has changed. And I think there's a lot that we've missed. It doesn't say anything to the foundings of our country, but something is different today and it's almost like if you think back to the Old Testament story, when Jerusalem was surrounded by King Nebuchadnezzar and besieged for two years. In the end of that, the walls were destroyed, the palace was torn down and burned, and they were all, most of them were hauled off to Babylon. There was nothing at all very subtle about that. But in our world today, it's like there's been this much more subtle besieging. And 
Of course, this is not a hard debate where we can say it's this way or it's this way. I just want to throw out some food for thought today. If we can allow ourselves to look at the possibility of changing our perspective on how we see ourselves in His kingdom, because if we see ourselves as those Israelites in Jerusalem, God's chosen people, blessed by God, it seems like it can be very easy to look at the world around you with disdain. That's kind of how it was for the Israelites. Whereas if we see ourselves as belonging to this eternal kingdom, but we are, we are just surrounded by a non-eternal kingdom, for the time being, we know that it's temporary. We know who we belong to. We know the foundation that we stand on. We can look at the world around us, in my opinion, in a more, in a more compassionate way, in, in a less judgmental way. You know, I think as believers, we are absolutely instructed to judge one another in the body. But it is not our job to judge outside of the body. That's God's job. So if we're, if we're looking at this dichotomy between the Israelites living in Jerusalem versus the Israelites living in Babylonian captivity, there's no better place to gain some insight into that than from the Old Testament. In particular, you could look at any one of the prophets in the Old Testament and find out where they were on the timeline and find out why they were writing what they were writing. Some of them were before the Babylonian captivity and some were after. Some were actually during that period of time. For example, probably the most well-known prophet in the Bible, Isaiah, he wrote down his prophecies within a hundred years prior to the attack on Jerusalem. And of course, like so many other prophets of his day, uh, he, he brought prophecies about this impending judgment that was coming upon Israel because of their shortfalls. Of course, it's also always coupled with the opportunity for repentance and God's eventual deliverance. On the other side of that, you have Daniel, who, of course, we know the story of Daniel from a very young age was taken to Babylon, and so the entire book of Daniel was written by him while he was living in Babylon for the rest of his entire life. Um, and of course, we know the stories in there are stories mostly of encouragement of this God that never leaves us or forsakes us in the wake of a lion's den or a fiery furnace. There's also all kinds of prophecies in Daniel that point to, well, what we refer to now as the end times. So you've got Isaiah that's quite a ways before the Babylonian captivity. You've got Daniel that's quite a ways after. But then you've got Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're more in the middle. The prophet Jeremiah, he was a couple of decades before the attack on Jerusalem. And of course, just like Isaiah, he was given words to give to the Israelites about this impending judgment that was coming and the opportunity for repentance. But if we want to see a picture of what it would look like if we were to see ourselves as believers living in that Babylonian captivity, there's no better place than in Jeremiah 29. This is where he's foretelling of the besieging of Jerusalem and how they're going to be carried off into a foreign land. But in this message that you would think would be full of doom, he tells them, while you were there in this foreign land, don't worry. I am with you. Build homes, plant gardens, have children, have sons and daughters. Give your sons and daughters in marriage because I want you to increase and not decrease. And this is where we, <clears throat> this is where we see the very famous, probably one of the most uh, well-known verses that comes out of Jeremiah that says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So even in these prophetic times of impending doom, 
we see this message that repeats over and over and over again. We even see the same thing from the prophet Ezekiel. Some of his prophecies would have coincided and overlapped with Jeremiah's, but he was actually in Babylon. He belonged to a group of people that was taken there a few years before the actual attack on Jerusalem. So Ezekiel was supposed to have been a priest in Jerusalem. And of course, all that went out the window when he was taken to Babylon. And if you open up to the first chapter of Ezekiel, you'll see that he's sitting on the banks of a river now, probably not knowing what to do. And it's when he's given this grand vision of, of God with these beings surrounding him and these wheels spinning inside of wheels. And it's this very strange sight, but the end result is he's been given a message to give to the Israelites about this impending judgment that's coming. And Ezekiel is even shown in these visions some of the horrible and detestable things that are taking place back in Jerusalem in the temple of God. So it's going to be clear the reasons for this judgment that's coming. And of course, shortly after that, everything that was prophesied happened. And so Ezekiel spends most of his life prophesying to the captive Israelites. But when you and I look back to all these prophets somewhere before Babylonian captivity, somewhere after, and we can gain these different perspectives, there's something very important that we have to keep in mind. There's something that is unique to you and I that no one in any of these time periods had. You see, in and among all of these specific prophecies about the Babylonian captivity, there was also, <clears throat> they're also filled with prophecies about this coming Messiah. We know through the book of Jeremiah, that's what it's, what it's most well known for, even the book of Isaiah, certainly. And so what you and I have to remember is we are living on the other side of that. We are no longer waiting for that deliverance. It has already come. It is already here. One of the, one of the best places to see this speaking in the book of Ezekiel, toward the end of his life, one of his final visions that he was given was this strange vision of a big pile of dead bones. And in this vision, these bones were suddenly brought to life by this spirit that came in like a wind. And these bones came to life and they were given flesh. Now imagine how would they have interpreted that then? I really can't give an answer to that, but what I do know is that we have Paul on this side of the cross telling you and I, you were dead in your transgressions and you've now been made alive in Christ. It's so important that we remember this about ourselves, that we're not in the same position that they were back in the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I was speaking with a, a colleague and a friend a while back, he was a fellow rancher. This was a little over a month ago when we were, we were all still wondering if it was ever going to rain. Things were, I mean, we all remember things were looking very dire. And in this conversation, you know, this, we're two believers talking in this. This is a very devout uh, salt of the earth kind of a guy. Uh, but the conversation turned to the world and how crazy things are getting and how, how things just seem to be spiraling out of control. And I don't think anybody here would, would disagree with that. But the comment that he made to me was, if we don't get things turned around, then we're, we're just basically waiting to be judged. He was taking this lack of rainfall as a sign of pending doom and judgment. I'm not very good in that situation if I disagree with somebody of speaking up and saying, you know, I, I disagree with you. But from then till now, I'm, I'm someone who likes to take a minute to digest things and then figure out what to do with it. 
but I just, I, I think that unfortunately is, is, is an all too common example of how we view our faith. Like we need to earn our blessings. But the fact of the matter is we have already been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. It's already done. There's nothing more that can be done for us and there's nothing that can be taken away from us, whether it rains or doesn't rain. Uh, an old friend and mentor used to phrase it that there's nothing that God can do to love us more and nothing that He can do to love us less. I was also speaking with another close friend just this past weekend, fellow believer. He was telling me a story of something that somebody had recently done to him that was just awful. It was this person that he had helped, that he had t taken in like a, like a family member, and it's, it, you know, it's a story we hear over and over and over again, but he just, he basically wound up getting stabbed in the back, and it was an awful story, and your heart just, you couldn't hurt hearing this story, but the comment that he made after he told me this was he said, because he's a good, kind-hearted person, he said, I don't wish anything ill on this person. But then he said, I believe in karma. And he said, if I wish ill on this person, that's gonna come back on me. And again, I wish I would have had the words in that moment, but I didn't. But I'm, I'm just believing that the future opportunity will come. But the thing of it is, this idea of karma, if you're not familiar, or even if you are, it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's, it's a Hindu term. But I don't think that the Hindus can claim ownership of this concept because this concept of doing good in order to get something good to come back to you, or if you do bad things, bad things come back to you, I think it's basic human nature to understand that. I mean, it, it just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Not only that, but it's not just a Hindu concept. It, it belongs, in, in my understanding, I can see it in just about every other religion of the world, this idea that if you do good things, good things will come back to you. Even in the Old Testament, I think you could make an argument that things were set up that way. But when our Heavenly Father sent His Son to come and be among us, He did it so in such a way to turn everything absolutely upside down. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He didn't wait until all of the things were done. He just came, He offered Himself he took all of the punishment that would have been due us and he took it away and he buried it at the bottom of the sea as far as the east is from the west. All the things that we've heard. And the New Testament concept that we have from this, among other places, is Paul telling us that while we were still sinners, in fact, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us ungodly. And it's not a system of karma. You see, now that we've gained all of that in a way that we didn't deserve any of it, we're made new. Like we now have the opportunity to not wish people ill. We now have the opportunity to pray for rain and even expect it. But more so than anything, we have the opportunity to simply just know who we belong to. We know from everything that it says in here that the world is going to continue to get crazier and crazier and crazier. It should come as no surprise at all to any of us. In fact, if we had the ability to go make the world a better place by, our, by the things that we do, then I would have to say that 
everything that was written down by the Apostle John that, that he said was shown to him by the risen Christ is a lie. So on that, if we've got this Old Testament perspective of living in Jerusalem prior to Babylonian captivity versus living after Babylonian captivity, but we know that our salvation has already come, we already possess it, we've already been blessed with those spiritual blessings, how do we explain the fact that we look around and we're still sitting here in what you could call Babylon? Well, I think this gets addressed. In the book of Revelation, which I just want to say is not a place that, um, that I often go. There's so much symbolism in this book, and there's so many things that are interpreted by different people in different ways, and it makes having those discussions very difficult. But that doesn't take away the importance of this book by any stretch. But in pertaining to what we're talking about today, this concept of Babylon, versus Jerusalem. If you go to Revelation 17, you'll see this typical symbolism that you see throughout the entire book. And it's this picture of this woman that's riding on a scarlet beast. And she's got a big cup in her hand and it's full of the blood of the saints and she's drunk on this blood. And she's riding this beast and she's sitting on many waters and it's all these things that are hard to picture but then if you read on to the end of 17 and into, even into chapter 18, it actually gives an explanation of, of what this is that John is seeing. He's told that this woman is Babylon and that the waters that she's sitting on are all the nations of the earth. So think about this from John's perspective. He lived at a time where the actual city of Babylon was long gone. It no longer existed. So it's like there's something else happening here. Even though the city of Babylon was long gone, the thing that survived and continues to this day are the philosophies, the religions, the systems. But I remember reading this a while back and like I say, I try not to get too hung up on Revelation, but when you read about this woman that's called Babylon, and you get into Revelation 18, it talks about Babylon falling. And the fall of Babylon is actually proclaimed loudly by an angel. And what does it look like when it falls? Well, it's not good. It's not good. But if I could condense this down to one portion of this chapter, because it's something that jumps off the page at me, is to give a clear definition as to what this is that just fell that's called Babylon. It certainly can't be a geographical city. I don't even believe it to be a geographical country. But what we do know is when it falls, there are three groups of people that are devastated. The first one is the kings of the earth because it says they had all committed immorality with this, with this woman, with this symbolic woman. The second one, the second group is the merchants of the earth who had said it all been made rich from this woman. And the third group if I were to put it in today's terms, I would call it the shippers. I think things were shown to John in a way that he would understand from the world that he lived in. And this third group is just labeled as anyone who makes their living by sailing on ships. But what's interesting is when it talks about the merchants that are wailing and weeping because of this fallen Babylon, it gives the reason why. It says, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because 
No one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron, marble, cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil, fine flour, wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. I think in our little corner of the world, it's really easy to feel like slavery is very much a thing of the past. But I've been told that it's more prevalent today than ever. But according to this passage in Revelation, there will come a day when all of it, along with everything else, comes to a screeching halt. And so it's understandable that you would see the kings of the earth and the merchants and the shippers all weeping over this. And I have to say, I'm a farmer and a rancher. It mentions wheat, both wheat and cattle in here. Apparently there's going to come a day when none of that's going to be moving. It's hard to imagine what that would be like. Now, doesn't it seem like it would be more important than ever to know where our identity lies? Like maybe instead of looking at myself as a farmer and a rancher, maybe it's better to look at myself as belonging to this royal priesthood and just placed here for the time being on a farm and a ranch. Maybe you're somewhere here, somebody here today that works for the railroad. Would it be good to place your identity as a railroader? Or would it be better to see yourself as a child of God, a member of this royal priesthood who's cleverly been disguised as a railroader? My point in all of this is that in this section of Revelation, it very much seems like this Babylon that comes crashing down is very much tied to a financial system. And I know there are people that come out with all sorts of predictions based on this book, and they say, well, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and that's not my aim today at all. But I think it does tell us that there is a day coming, and it's not hard to look around at just the last two years and see where things that we never thought would have been possible could really be possible. None of that is important, is as important as something else that's pointed out in this chapter though. You see, when you read chapter 18, he talks about hearing a voice of an angel saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon. And it gives a description of that. But then afterward, he said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not receive of her plagues. I remember reading through that a while back and just assuming that this second voice that John heard must have been another angel, because the first voice it said was an angel. But this was one of those times where you go back and you reread something and you notice something you didn't notice before, it, number one, it doesn't say that it was an angel. It says another voice from heaven saying, but it, it's, it's what the voice says, come out of her, my people. What, what, what occurred to me in that moment was, I'm not aware of angels having people. So if there's this voice saying, come out of her, my people, and remember who was showing John all of this in the first place. It was the risen Christ. Doesn't it stand to reason that this second voice that John hears should be the voice none other than our Savior? So I remember pondering this and thinking, okay, if this thing, this system that we're immersed in, if it is truly in fact tied to a, a financial system, and we're told to come out of her, how do we go about doing that? Because, I mean, every time you fill up your tank at the gas station, every time you buy groceries, every time you write a check at church, you're partaking in that system. I, I literally cannot think of how we could pull that off. The barter system. <laughs> 
We, it's been done before. But can you imagine having to barter for absolutely everything? I mean, because of course, yes, our mind goes there, but, but here's, what, here's what occurred to me in that moment. If this is the voice of Jesus that John heard that said, come out of her, my people. You know, this isn't the only time in the New Testament that we see a record of Jesus saying, come out. You know, there's, there's stories about demon-possessed people in the New Testament where Jesus would just walk up to them and say, come out or go or leave. But that's not even the one that jumped out at me that I want to share with you that we're all familiar with. In John chapter 11, it's the story of Lazarus. When Jesus travels to see his friend Lazarus who had just passed away, and by the time he gets there, he's been in the tomb for four days. He's starting to rot. They can smell it. You know the story. His sisters are there. Their friends are all there. Everyone is crying. Jesus is weeping. But it says that he was deeply moved. And after they rolled the stone away, he just stood in front of the tomb and said, Lazarus, come out. So think about Lazarus in that moment. I can't imagine him sitting in the tomb wondering what, what he must do to come out because Jesus just told him to come out. I'm not even sure he could have because it says that his hands and his feet were tied with linens. All I know is Jesus said, come out, and he came out and he was alive, like those dry bones. So can you imagine, this is not something I can put a solid finger on. All it is is <clears throat> something that feels like a, a, a spoken word, but when you, when you see these things in the Word and you wrestle and you struggle and you ask questions and sometimes answers seem to come, to me, it seems like I've realized I don't have to try to figure it out. I don't have to try to figure out how to get out of this huge mess that we're all in. Like, we didn't really create the mess. We're part of it. All I do know is there's a time when it's going to fall, and there's a time when he's going to come back and he's going to say, come out. I believe that all we need to do is to realize that, to understand it, to be excited about it because we know who we belong to, and to tell others. Does that mean that we shouldn't go out into the world and do good? It absolutely does not mean that. We, we are called to let our light shine, but it's not because of karma. It's not so that good things can come back to us. It's because we already have been given everything. It doesn't matter how messed up the world is getting. It doesn't matter how much it rains or doesn't rain. Everything could come crashing down tomorrow and we could all get hauled off into intern camps that could truly be like Babylonian captivity and it does not matter because what we have is the firmest foundation that could ever possibly be and there's nothing that can take that away. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, I just, um, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your written word. I thank you for your spoken word. I thank you for the, I thank you for your spirit, that it never leaves us, um, that it truly does reside in us as our helper. I thank you for the fact, Lord, that none of us here have ever gotten what we deserved. In fact, you took it for us. And I thank you and I praise you for that, Lord. 
I pray, Lord, for this fallen world around us, as you've instructed us to do. We know that it's only going to be so long. It might be tomorrow. It might be 10 years. It might be 1,000 years. Lord, it matters not. All that matters is that we belong to you and that your arms are open wide and extended and you've allowed us the opportunity to be your hands and feet to tell others. I thank you and I praise you. I thank you for each and every individual here today. I pray for Rick in his time of absence. Pray that you'll bring him home safely and his family. Pray for Jeremiah next week. I pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. We're going to stand if you are able to sing a song in the sanctuary. And again, thank you, Jody, for the words there. And if, if you have a, a prayer or a concern, you are welcome to come on down. Please stand as you are able. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, true and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. It was you, Lord, who gave the Savior heart and soul, Lord, to every man. It is you, Lord, who knows my weakness, you refine me your own hand lead me O Lord through all temptation as you refine me from within fill our hearts with your Holy Take away all my sin. We're going to sing that first verse a cappella. Let's sing it from our hearts. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Would you please be seated? Good morning again, everyone. For our time of communion this morning, um, actually my verse of the day was probably one of the best ones that I, I looked at in preparation for this morning. Uh, Galatians 2, 19 through 21. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave me, gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And I tried to think of a way to paraphrase this, and the footnotes in my Bible probably put it best, so I'll share that with you as well. When we are crucified with Christ, 
It means that we agree to surrender to Jesus every dimension of our sinful lives, our goals, plans, ideas, and even relationships. We treat these things as though they died with Jesus on the cross. Then we live a life of surrender to the author of life. Because Jesus came back to life, he now lives in us by the Holy Spirit, filling up the empty places that we have given to him, which are all our pursuits could not really fill. Our self-centered way of lives end, and our new Christ-centered way of life begins. This happens initially when we first believe in Jesus, but we must continually deny our sinful desires and take up our cross daily. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we're just so grateful for you this morning, Lord. We're so grateful for, uh, for Jody and his message. Lord, it's because of you that uh, we can live our lives, Lord, without sin. Lord, we can turn to you uh, in those hard times, Lord, when we fall short. Lord, we know that you, you died on that cross for us, Lord, so we could uh, serve you today. Lord, we're just so grateful for you and all that you've done for us. We just ask these things in your name. Amen. For our time of offering this morning, I'm going to share with you out of the Amplified Version. That's why I'm reading off my phone. I'm going to be in uh, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God in every remembrance of you, always offering every prayer of mine with joy and with specific requests for all of you. Thanking God for your participation and partnership, both your confronting fellowship and gracious contributions and advancing the good news regarding salvation from the first day you heard it until now. I am convinced and confident in everything that he, he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ and his return. So just as uh, in Philippines here, um, how the people of Philippi treated Paul. Um, they always welcomed him back and they always supported his, his mission um, to, to spread the good word. That is exactly what we're here to do today uh, through your contributions and your, your hard work. Um, we'll be able to give back not only to this church, um, but to our community and uh, to all our missionaries that uh, are out there spreading the word for us. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we're just so, so thankful for all that you've given us, Lord. We're just here this morning, Lord, to give back a portion of that to you, Lord, uh, with love, 
and graciousness, Lord, to uh, further your word in this kingdom. We just ask this in your name. Amen. thankful that you're here. We just pray that you will have been brought closer to Jesus and to our Lord and Master, and that you'll be encouraged one with another, and you can encourage one another uh, in, in that walk that we all have together uh, as we work in this fallen world, as Jody said. I did want to quick read uh, a couple of announcements, and one of them is for the men. You have been invited to a men's barbecue here at FACC this Wednesday, June 29th at 6 p.m. Come play games and fellowship. Please text Les Odegaard to let him know that you are planning to attend in order to have a head count for the groceries. And so that's one thing. And down the road, I know it's a month away or actually more than a month away, but there will be church in the park again this year, August 21st, and more information there to follow. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the cause for the church today? Uh, we go down to the one by the uh, Catholic uh, church across there. It's called Pepin Park. Pepin Park. Okay? All right, would you please stand? <clears throat> I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Have a great week. We'll see some of you on Wednesday. We'll see you next week.